James Herriot, All Creatures Great and Small On a frigid Yorkshire night, James Herriot lies on the cobbled floor of a draughty barn. He's arm deep inside a cow which is struggling to deliver a calf. As snow whirls in through the open doorway settling on Harriet's exposed back, he's a stark contrast to the composed and clean figure of a vet in the obstetrics book he once studied. This scene sets the tone for a journey through the life of a young veterinarian in rural England. Through Harriet's eyes, you'll be plunged into the semi-autobiographical tale of a country vet, where every day is an unpredictable blend of challenges and rewards. From the gritty details of veterinary procedures in less-than-ideal settings to the heartwarming interactions between farmers and their animals, you'll witness the personal growth of a veterinarian navigating the complexities of his profession. So what happened to the cow struggling to give birth? You'll have to keep going to find out. A Night in the Barn In a freezing Yorkshire barn, Young veterinarian James Herriot is engaged in a gruelling battle to save a calf's life, his arm buried inside the mother cow. Herriot, stripped to the waist and shivering, is determined to deliver the calf despite the overwhelming odds. The calf's head is improperly positioned, making the delivery exceptionally difficult. Additionally, the pressure of the cow's contractions on his arm test Herriot's physical limits. The atmosphere in the barn is tense. The farmer and his son watch Harriet's every move, their expressions filled with worry and doubt. Adding to the pressure, an elderly relative, uncle, is present, offering unsolicited advice and comparisons with another local vet, Mr Broomfield. Despite the challenges, Harriet continues his painstaking work. He employs various techniques, from repelling a leg to using a blunt hook in the eye socket, but each attempt is met with limited success. The situation becomes increasingly dire, with Harriet questioning whether the calf will survive the prolonged and complicated delivery. In a decisive moment, Harriet manages to secure a looped rope around the calf's lower jaw. This small victory brings hope, but the struggle is far from over. Harriet must now coordinate his efforts with the farmer to gently guide the calf into a proper position for delivery. The tension reaches a peak as the calf's head finally emerges, followed by the rest of its body. The animal appears lifeless at first, lying motionless on the cold floor. But Harriet doesn't give up. He clears the mucus from the calf's mouth and begins artificial respiration, a last-ditch effort to revive the newborn. Miraculously, the calf shows signs of life, gasping for air and moving its limbs. The mother, initially unresponsive and exhausted, becomes animated upon sensing her calf's presence. She begins to lick and nuzzle the little creature, her maternal instincts kicking in. This simple yet profound act of care breathes new life into the calf as it gradually gains strength and starts to sit up. This, Harriet thinks, is his favourite part. The miracle that never ever gets old. Arriving in the Yorkshire Dales Sometime prior to the incident with the calf in a rickety bus under the July sun, James Herriot arrived in the Yorkshire Dales. Clad in his best suit, he headed to Darraby for a life-changing interview with a vet named Siegfried Farnen. As a newly qualified veterinary surgeon in the early to mid-1900s, Herriot was facing a grim job market where agriculture was in decline and opportunities were scarce. But Yorkshire surprised him. Instead of the dull and charmless place he'd imagined, it turned out to be a picturesque landscape of grassy hills, stone farmhouses and endless dry stone walls. When he arrives in Darraby, Harriet's anxiety begins to mount as horror stories of cruel veterinary bosses he'd heard circulate in his mind. He imagines Siegfried Farnan, his potential employer, as either a roly-poly German with merry eyes or a hulking, cold-eyed Teuton. Skeldale House, where Harriet's interview is to take place, is a Georgian building with an old-fashioned brass plate. Its ivy-covered façade and peeling paint speak of a timeless elegance. But his wait for Farnan is filled with unexpected encounters, each adding to the surreal quality of his first day in Darraby. There's a farmer seeking veterinary assistance for his cow in cryptic terms, and a gentleman requiring medicine for his vomiting dog. There's also an elegantly dressed, red-haired lady who it turns out is also expecting Farnan for tea. 
Their interaction only underscores Harriet's feeling of being an outsider in this new environment. As Harriet contemplates his uncertain future in the garden, Siegfried Farnan finally arrives, shattering Harriet's image of a German vet. Farnan, quintessentially English in appearance and demeanour, apologises sincerely for forgetting their appointment. Despite the initial confusion, Farnan's casual attitude and the charm of Skeldale House begin to put Harriet at ease. First Encounters in Yorkshire Harriet's initiation into rural veterinary practice with Siegfried Farnan begins in the old servants' quarters of Skeldale House. There they find themselves in the dispensary, a place that was once the heart of veterinary medicine. The dispensary is lined with Winchester bottles full of old remedies, from sweet spirits of nitre to chlorodyne. Each bottle is a reminder of Harriet's extensive studies and the rich heritage of veterinary practice. Yet, Harriet can't help but notice that some of the remedies don't quite meet modern standards. The melodramatically labelled Colic Drench showcases a time when veterinary practice was as much art as science. Harriet's first test comes later that day at a nearby farm with a lame horse. Under Farnan's watchful eye, he diagnoses the animal with pus in the foot, a common ailment locally known as gravel. This condition is painful and can cause significant distress to the animal. Feeling very much like he's on trial, Harriet sets about treating the horse by cleaning the hoof, probing the area and draining the abscess. The procedure requires a gentle touch and precision, as the horse is in discomfort and might react unpredictably. Harriet successfully treats the horse, earning Farnan's approval. The day's challenges continue as they visit a calf with a cut leg, which Harriet skillfully stitches and bandages. Then, at Mr Sharp's farm, they encounter a cow with a blocked teat. While Harriet has his instrument halfway into the cow's teat, the cow unexpectedly knocks Harriet into a dung channel, adding a humorous twist to the otherwise serious task. Despite the setback, Harriet manages to clear the blockage with Sharp and Farnan's assistance. On the way back to Darrowby, Farnan offers Harriet the job. As payment, he'll receive full board plus four quid a week. Since Harriet had been expecting only board, the additional four pounds was a princely addition indeed. Tricky Woo As autumn transitions into winter in the Yorkshire Dales, Harriet begins to experience the harsher side of veterinary practice. He faces long drives with frozen feet and biting winds. His chapped hands worsen with the rush of work. But one client brings blessed relief from the gruelling routine. Mrs Pumphrey, a wealthy widow living in a beautiful house called Balby Grange on the outskirts of Darrowby. Mrs Pumphrey's life revolves around her thoroughly spoiled Pekingese, Tricky Woo. Unable to refuse Tricky's repeated pleas for treats, Mrs Pumphrey freely rewards him with fancy cakes and titbits. This leads to Tricky's recurrent illness, blocked anal glands that require draining, necessitating Harriet's visits. Harriet repeatedly warns Mrs Pumphrey about feeding the dog a diet much too rich for his size, but the warnings make little impact on Tricky's enamoured mistress. During his visits, Harriet thoroughly takes advantage of Mrs Pumphrey's luxurious lifestyle, complete with glasses of sherry and cocktail biscuits. All the while, Mrs Pumphrey regales Harriet with increasingly fantastical tales and exploits of her precious Tricky. These include how Tricky studied the racing forms to pick winning horses, began a pen-pal correspondence with another dog, his mysterious feud with the garden summer house, and how one day he suddenly went cracker dog, manically running in circles before collapsing unconscious. In return for his visits, Harriet receives lavish gifts from Tricky, boxes of delicious oak-smoked kippers, vine-ripened tomatoes and tins of tobacco. Realising the benefits of nurturing this relationship, Harriet starts writing thank you letters directly to Tricky, though he feels a slight sense of guilt for indulging the charade. Returning to Skeldale House after these visits, Harriet is met with Siegfried's teasing remarks about his hard work at Barby Grange. Harriet's time with Tricky and Mrs Pumphrey offers a glimpse into the lighter, more humorous aspects of veterinary practice. The Colourful Characters of Darabee Harriet's life as a young veterinarian is filled with unique characters and experiences. One such character is Tristan, the younger brother of his employer Siegfried Farnan. 
Tristan hitchhikes to Darraby from Edinburgh, where he's attending veterinary college. He arrives with a charming smile and a carefree, mischievous attitude, contrasting sharply with the more serious and methodical Siegfried. A memorable moment occurs when Tristan's exam results are due. Tristan sheepishly tells Siegfried that he did all right in parasitology, but failed pathology. Siegfried is furious and launches into a tirade, telling Tristan that he's sacking him from the clinic. Later, Tristan tells James that he isn't worried. Siegfried is always sacking him and then forgetting. Also, he, unlike what he told Siegfried, actually failed both of his exams. But he's not worried. He'll just pass them after Christmas. Meanwhile, Harriet's professional life leads him to Heston Grange, where he meets Helen Alderson. Helen, a capable and attractive young woman, runs her family's farm with grace and efficiency. Their first encounter occurs during a routine veterinary visit to treat a lame calf. Harriet is immediately struck by Helen's practical skills and her deep connection to the land and animals. Soon, Harriet and Helen find themselves drawn together more frequently. They share a love for the countryside and a mutual respect for the hard work and dedication required in rural life. One evening, Harriet decides to take Helen out to a grand hotel, the Reniston, under the impression that there'd be a dinner dance. It's a significant step for James, marking his first formal outing with Helen. The evening is filled with anticipation and excitement, but to Harriet's dismay, when they arrive at the Reniston, they discover that there's no dance that night. Their disappointment is compounded by a series of mishaps, including car trouble caused by flooding roads. After the disastrous evening finally ends, Harriet assumes that Helen will never want to see him again and vows not to contact her. The Bad and the Good As Harriet continues his tenure in Darraby, he finds himself regularly confronted by both tragedy and humour. One poignant instance comes when he receives a sudden call to visit an old dog. The dog is ill at an address in one of Darabi's tucked-away yards down a narrow Dickensian passageway where crooked little houses bow under the weight of decay. At number three, pensioner Mr Dean welcomes James anxiously inside and introduces him to his sick old dog, Bob. After his wife had died, Bob became Mr Dean's sole companion. Now Bob lay whimpering, his abdomen bloated with fluid. Harriet had seen this frequently enough before. The dog had a large tumour, aggressive and inoperable. Harriet meets Mr Dean's hopes with the brutal truth. After silently communing with his companion, Mr Dean consents to ending Bob's days painlessly. Harriet dispenses a quick, peaceful injection. Watching the man kneel, cradling Bob's grey muzzle, leaves Harriet ruining his powerlessness as he departs the dingy home. In contrast, Harriet encounters a lighter situation with his regular patron, Mrs Pumphrey, and her spoilt Pekingese, Tricky Woo. Despite Harriet's warnings, Mrs Pumphrey has continued to indulge Tricky, causing him to swell into a sausage-like form. Tricky can hardly walk, much less beg for food. Instead, he repeatedly vomits and pants in distress. To address this, Harriet insists that Tricky must be taken to the clinic for observation. Though this prospect leaves Mrs Pumphrey distraught, Harriet manages to introduce Tricky to a more natural, active lifestyle at the clinic. Siegfried Farnan owns five of his own dogs, and although Tricky is initially lethargic and disinterested, he soon begins to engage. He discovers the joys of play and exercise, activities that had been foreign to him in his pampered life. As Tricky's health improves, Mrs Pumphrey remains anxious, calling for updates and sending gifts to aid the pup's recovery, from fresh eggs to bottles of sherry and brandy. These, of course, are enjoyed more by Harriet and the Farnans than by Tricky Woo. James and Helen Mortified by what he perceives to have been a disastrous first date, Harriet stops pursuing Helen. For a while, he even tries not to think of her. But fate has other plans. Their paths eventually cross again when Helen comes to Siegfried's clinic seeking help for her injured sheepdog, Dan. This encounter reignites their connection and they find themselves slipping back into the comfortable rapport they once shared. In a bid to rekindle their relationship, Harriet invites Helen to join him for an evening at the cinema. But like the first one, this date just doesn't seem destined to go as planned. 
After sitting down in the theatre, Harriet and Helen discover that the film they intended to watch has been unexpectedly replaced with a western called Arizona Guns. James begins to think that his chances have been ruined yet again. But then Helen starts to laugh. She laughs as though she hasn't laughed in a long time, with her whole body and for a long time. Harriet is relieved. Perhaps he still has a chance with Helen after all. After their unexpectedly successful date, Harriet continues to pursue Helen. But not everything is smooth sailing. Helen's father, Mr Alderson, harbours reservations about Harriet. Because of this, Harriet continues to hesitate and delay asking Helen for her hand in marriage. But Harriet's colleague, Siegfried Farnan, isn't having this. Recognising Harriet's hesitation and caution, Siegfried animatedly insists that Harriet seize the moment and propose to Helen. He highlights the potential for a future partnership at Skeldale House and the possibility of creating a home together in the spacious residence. Taking Siegfried's advice to heart, Harriet proposes to Helen, and to his delight she accepts. Their union is celebrated amidst the beauty of the Dales, marking the beginning of a lifetime of shared adventures and happiness. Here's a brief summary of the plot of All Creatures Great and Small. A young veterinarian, James Herriot, embarks on his career in the Yorkshire Dales, facing the realities of rural veterinary practice. From his initial daunting interview with Siegfried Farnan, to the endearing and often humorous experiences with animals like Tricky Woo, Herriot grows as a vet both personally and professionally. His journey is marked by challenges, like the strenuous delivery of a calf in a freezing barn, and triumphs, including his courtship of Helen Alderson, amidst the backdrop of a picturesque yet demanding rural landscape. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed our retelling of All Creatures Great and Small. Please leave us a rating or a comment. We always appreciate your feedback. And we'll see you in the next Blink.